on turning my <clears throat> screen off and welcoming Rob. Um, thank you so much uh, for being here. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk. And uh, Will and Sam at ACORN certainly appreciate the, uh, the connection. Um, I have the, the great opportunity this afternoon to talk to you all about just different things I've learned in this crazy world of urban green infrastructure. Uh, it's kind of the, the presentation today is sort of the con conglomeration of a lot of different little bits and pieces. Some of you may have heard little segments of this uh, over the years, but it's sort of a constantly evolving thing as I get more exposed to different things that are happening out there in the world of green stormwater infrastructure. Um, so I'm Rob Woodman, I'm a professional engineer with uh, ACF Environmental, which was just acquired by Ferguson uh, Enterprises, or more specifically Ferguson Waterworks, uh, just before Christmas. And so we're in the midst of all kinds of uh, integration and, and dealing, dealing with that merger. Um, but fortunately, um, due to my experience in this green infrastructure space, I was invited to take on the role uh, of Director of Urban Green Infrastructure for, for Ferguson Enterprises uh, on a national basis. So I'm based right in Maine, um, which is awesome. I love where I live in Maine. I grew up in Australia, so I have a weird accent, um, but um, I'm now uh, taking on the universe in this uh, world of urban uh, green infrastructure. Uh, so ACF used to be an East Coast company. Uh, now we have this footprint that's national um, and uh, I'm slowly building a team of, of experts in this green infrastructure space to kind of help uh, solve challenges uh, throughout um, the nation. When I do these presentations, I, I work for a products company, but when I do these presentations, my goal is to step a little bit away from the product side of things and really focus on things, lessons learned and things I've seen uh, in other programs uh, up and down the East Coast. Uh, so my background, for those who don't know me, uh, and it's awesome to see a lot of familiar faces, and I'm stoked that there's a bunch of landscape architects on the line too, because I will definitely uh, be poking some jokes at civil engineers as we go along. Um, I, uh, I was a consulting engineer for 10 years right in South Portland, DeLuca Hoffman, which became FST and now is Stantec. Um, and then the last seven years I've been uh, with ACF, now Ferguson, uh, sort of on the product side or the solution side. Um, trying to work out how to come up with um, new solutions to challenging problems in this green infrastructure um, space. Um, I've also had the chance to monitor a lot of systems, which is kind of cool. So I'm um, not just purely doing design work, but actually seeing what they look like after the fact. Um, and I've also been engaged in um, third party inspections uh, to help uh, through a small little um, subsidiary I own called Northeast Stormwater Services to also continue to look at how these various uh, stormwater best management practices or BMPs uh, are performing. Uh, and for those who are trying to uh, launch their YouTube careers like I am with my whopping 36 followers right now, uh, I also have a vlog called Lidbit. You can check that out, which covers just a lot of our systems and different things that have gone in the ground uh, after the fact, because I think so often we're focused on that completing the design or completing the installation. But what happens, what do we learn after that point in years to come when it um, you know, related to performance uh, and maintenance? So I've had a great opportunity to see a lot of those different pieces. I work with all kinds of engineered solutions from erosion right through to our complete uh, suite of stormwater solutions. Uh, and as I've tried to build out our solutions in this space, you know, the key has been trying to address some of these key challenges we see uh, in the urban green infrastructure scape, streetscapes. So looking at you know, space efficient options, looking at versatility and flexibility, uh, obviously having high performance, uh, looking at that balance between um, maintenance and the expectations of that, uh, and then obviously making sure things are, are cost appropriate. So those are sort of some of the goals or the pillars I have to kind of work through as it relates to finding and, and working out where various solutions and products might fit in. Um, more recently, been really focused on this, uh, the biggest issue that I see in urban GSI programs um, around the country, and that is uh, the need for better pretreatment to basically make maintenance more palatable and essentially protect these uh, green infrastructure assets that are going uh, in the ground every day. Um, so, you know, I've bought, built out a whole engineering team to support what we're doing on a larger scale. We've really invested in the importance of being involved on the job site. Um, and actually seeing how these systems go in, complications with installation, um, communications with contractors, uh, what we learn from that, uh, and then really have evolved this sort of industrial design group. We've always done a lot of work um, in the geosynthetic and geomembrane space with liners and fabrics, um, but now we've really get, got into this um, developing solutions for specific municipal stormwater programs, uh, and I'm gonna highlight some of those today. Uh, and by, by way of doing that, really engage in some really cool 
on collaborative partnerships. Um, but before we get too much into that, let's just take a little step back and talk about what green, green infrastructure is. It, it's a term that's fairly flexible and can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, if you look at the EPA website, uh, it'll identify green infrastructure um, as a cost-effective, resilient approach to managing wet weather impacts that provides many community benefits. Uh, they go further to say that while gray traditional stormwater infrastructure, which might be, you know, your conventional pipe drainage and, and water treatment systems, is designed to move urban stormwater away from the built environment, <clears throat> green infrastructure reduces and treats uh, at its source uh, while delivering environmental, social, and economic benefits. So treating it on uh, at its source, how do you do that? So you're using vegetation, soils, other elements and practices to restore some of those natural processes that maybe exist before that environment was built up. Uh, at a city or county scale, green infrastructure is a patchwork of natural areas that provides habitat, cool, flood protection, cleaner air and cleaner water. Uh, at the neighborhood or site scale, stormwater management systems are identified you know, as ways to sort of mimic nature or soak up and store some of that water on site. So just a little background to this whole uh, green infrastructure space. And I'm gonna use the term GSI a fair bit today, uh, which in my book stands for Green Stormwater Infrastructure. So that's our little acronym uh, for the day. Um, how do folks do this? What kind of techniques are used? There's all kinds of things, you know, downspout disconnection, rainwater harvesting, rain gardens, planter boxes, bioswales, permeable pavements, um, which is pretty popular too. Uh, I know Will and his team have a lot of experience uh, on that side of things. Green streets, alleys, which are often tied into that permeable space. Uh, green roofs, even blue roofs these days. We're restoring water on roofs of buildings um, and then looking at the impacts and benefits of uh, tree canopies as it relates to uh, reduction heat island and all these types of things. So a lot of different things people can pick from. Um, the challenge in urban environments is that you are dealing with tight spaces. You're dealing with working around existing infrastructure. So there's a lot of complexities here. Um, maybe you're affecting local business when you're installing these systems. <clears throat> Um, often there's a need to actually have some kind of performance metrics to actually work towards a goal, whether there's a consent decree or whatever it may be. Um, and when you get into green, green infrastructure, there's this balance between needing to have the functional stormwater element, but also a, an opportunity for the feature and the aesthetic side of things. And with all of that, anytime you're in a city environment, the maintenance challenges are much more pronounced than what you'd see on a much larger open site, like a school or a you know, whatever area where you have a lot more space um, to manage uh, stormwater. No two, no two cities are the same. So when you look at um, sort of overlay um, all those different challenges, but then there's additional challenges on a city specific basis. So there's all design variables, like, you know, how much space is available to do a, a install a system, uh, what style of grates exists, what are the typical watershed sizes you might see in a certain area. And in different states, there's a huge variation. Um, are you dealing with steep slopes, which can add additional challenges? Uh, what's the pollutant of concern? Or is it just volume? A lot of the cities I work in, it's mostly volume based. So you're mostly looking at collecting trash and debris, whereas you get up into Maine, now nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen in some circumstances really matter. And that's a totally different design approach, depending on what you're trying to treat uh, or manage. But then you get the other less definable variables, right? So opinions and perspectives, um, which are, are beautiful and challenging all at the same time. Um, past experiences, maybe on that municipal level, what have, what have we learned from the past? Um, budgets, uh, equipment, especially in the maintenance size, what do we have in place to actually maintain these systems or these assets moving forward? Um, expectations, which includes a public element. We put these beautiful renderings on the board. Are we actually gonna build them and maintain them so they continue to look like that? Are we allowing our vegetation to survive and thrive? Um, and that sort of ties into the expectations for uh, aesthetics of these GSI systems too. Um, and when you get up into the Northeast, you also have that winter consideration, which definitely needs to be factored in um, to how we do um, these designs. So a little overview of some city GSI programs that are out there that I've done some work with. Um, the first, um, again, you know, each city kind of has their own take, right? They use green infrastructure, bioretention, rain gardens, permeable surfaces, but they all do it in slightly different ways in their own kind of personal way. Uh, Philadelphia, the uh, Green City Clean Waters Program, um, great goal um, of you know, managing 10,000 acres of impervious over 25 years, which includes a ton of streetscapes. Um, so it's a pretty robust program that's out there. Uh, and the former uh, PWD, that's the Philadelphia Water Department who would administer that program, commissioner said, you know, the, key, the key to this uh, you know, green street program is to develop a seamless process whereby stormwater management, street engineering, landscape design come together 
to produce a functional, attractive and cost efficient project. Uh, and then he talks about the, the goals of the manual. So this idea of all these different groups needing to come together to sort of have one uh, complete design and project. And they have a variety of different ways that they express their green infrastructure down in Philly. Um, you know, we do a lot of subsurface systems down there. So small space efficient subsurface systems. Uh, we do work under parks, under public areas there, trying to maximize storage. Again, the goal here is volume. Um, Philly also has their own kind of streetscape concepts with, you know, small street edge bump outs. Uh, here's one that we were working on last fall. Uh, and then larger rain gardens with, you know, a great opportunity for public education and signage. When you get into New York City, you know, similar similarities there between Philly and New York City, but a slightly different approach. So in, in New York City, uh, there's this kind of triple bottom line or this win, win, win for New York with the primary goal of the program to reduce combined sewer overflow. So it's not as tied into water quality, um, but to look at a cost effective way to do that and look at the environmental benefits. Um, and uh, the co-benefits there have been identified as, you know, increased urban greening, which is always good. Uh, the heat island reduction, another benefit in these really impervious base cities um, and creating habitat for birds and pollinators. A little hard to get my head wrapped around that in New York City, but certainly, you know, a good goal to work, work towards and a massive amount of gallons that need to be managed to get to that point. But, you know, they've had their challenges as well. You know, these right away bias whales, again, on the pretreatment side, really struggling with um, from the aesthetic side of things, um, how much trash and debris, obviously the civil engineers look at this and think, wow, this is working fantastically. Uh, while uh, Mark Johnson and others maybe aren't too convinced that green infrastructure is meant to, to look like this. Um, but, you know, typical, these curb line bias whales, they also do uh, buried uh, stone pits as well as their infiltration basin. So a sort of smaller subset of uh, BMP options, um, but, you know, the ability to drop and drag and place those in, uh, you know, hundreds of locations throughout the city. <clears throat> In Pittsburgh, um, PWSA, um, so Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, um, have a very creative approach to green infrastructure. They're a little earlier on in the process than where New York City uh, and Philadelphia are. Um, Pittsburgh has the added challenge of having fairly steep streets. So we do a lot of terraced systems out there, providing storage underneath a variety of um, pretty creatively designed and landscaped um, fire retention systems or rain gardens, where you have kind of groups of systems with little spillovers <clears throat> as you work your way down. You know, this is the kind of challenge you might see downtown in Portland when you've got some steeper streets, <clears throat> excuse me, um, whereas, you know, Philly and New York tend to be uh, a lot flatter. Um, we found some really, there's been some really interesting challenges and in Pittsburgh, just like up here in Maine, we, you know, we struggle with high groundwater table and very little room to work. Um, so this was a cool project. We worked a, a playground redevelopment project we, where we provided a ton of uh, modular storage under the play equipment. Um, to provide a lot of storage uh, where we were really close to um, groundwater, had terrible subgrade, and also had to work around playground equipment footings and whatnot. And I've seen a lot of both in Philly and Pittsburgh, and even Lancaster, PA, a lot of cool projects that involve um, improving public facilities like parks, which is a great win-win there where you get the stormwater benefit, but you're also providing a public amenity. Uh, Washington, D.C., um, starting to get a little involved down there. Uh, DC Water administers that program, and they kind of have two go-tos um, on the green infrastructure side, permeable pavement or green alleys, as they call them, uh, and then bioretention. retention. But a lot of DC ends up being put in tunnels, deep, deep, deep tunnels, um, uh, and only a small portion of their work is in green infrastructure. It's interesting when you look at these four programs, um, you know, the, the thing they all have in common is they're mostly looking at volume reductions. So water quality is kind of a secondary benefit. Um, the focus is water. So there's a lot more storage, and a lot more pretreatment of storage and less focus on key pollutants like phosphorus and nitrogen, bacteria, hydrocarbons, these types of things. When you look at the city of Portland, um, you've got a slightly different um, uh, concern. So you're looking at volume, but there's also a water quality piece too, right? So we're tied into sort of generally the way that you know, chapter 500 is designed, which is very heavy on phosphorus removal, uh, regardless of what watershed you're in. Uh, and so that changes the kind of nature of some of the BMPs that you need to look at deploying. Um, obviously, there's several cool new initiatives out there with the stormwater utility in place. Now there's a funding source to, um, you know, um, for the city to um, design and implement uh, green infrastructure BMPs throughout the city, which is really exciting. Uh, and my hope is that, you know, with some of these other programs that are a little further along, the city of Portland can benefit from some of those lessons learned and not have to kind of go through the pain of learning those uh, on their own. 
Um, and there's incentives for developers to go above and beyond the regulations for stormwater feed credits. So a lot of the, the engineers and developers we support with products on the product side of things, I've noticed are over-designing the water quality elements of their design um, to get the maximum credit on these uh, redevelopment sites. And there's a ton of talented designers in, in Portland. Um, I think the, the best stormwater designers, both on the landscape architecture side and the civil engineering side that I've come across in my travels, a, a, in, in Maine, and I don't say that just to suck up to the audience today, there's a real genuine understanding of the, the impact of stormwater and how to design efficiently and effectively. I don't see that everywhere else I go. Uh, we've seen engineers do some really creative um, designs on really tight infill sites. This is on the corner of Boyd and Oxford, um, a little biofilter that was done with a bunch of storage under this uh, concrete um, patio area, um, some terrace systems using sheet piles. Uh, I think a little glitch there on the slide, there it is. Uh, even raised planters. So I love to see some of the creativity and flexibility that the local designers I have. And some of the projects I love to share with engineers and um, uh, program managers throughout the country a lot of the projects I show are right here in, in the Portland area. Uh, even city kind of leading by example, this is a project we supported on the permeable paper side of things uh, in Deering Oaks a couple of years ago. Um, so seeing little bits and pieces of those projects now start to come to play where the city is in, incorporating GSI features uh, into their designs. Uh, and from my side of things, really interesting. This is a map, very simple thing I whipped up. Uh, it is not fully comprehensive. It probably only covers projects up to about a year ago. Um, but this five years ago, we had no dots on the map in, the, in downtown Portland area. Uh, and this is just to give you a little key into where systems have been implemented. And that's just using products that I work with. I know there's tons of other more traditional and generic systems that are out there too. So it's been really encouraging to see as sites get redeveloped um, the incorporation of uh, green infrastructure features um, throughout the city. So in terms of lessons learned, um, you know, when I look back and I think about um, my opportunity, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have been able to support um, a series of cities and towns uh, with regard to providing solutions for green infrastructure challenges. Philadelphia, New York City, and Pittsburgh are probably the three I've done the most in. Um, what have I learned? Um, you know, that collaboration is really important. Uh, and not just in design, not just in construction, but maintenance needs to be part of the conversation if we want to be able to have assets that are you know, palatable from a long-term cost of ownership. Uh, moving forward. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about collaboration. Some of you have heard my little spiel on collaboration before, so hopefully it won't be too repetitive. Um, but what I found is, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders involved in these projects and we need to come together if we're going to get good outcomes. Uh, the other thing we have to recognize is that no two cities are the same. And I've learned that over a period of time, you know, I've solved some problems in Philly, thought, oh, we can do this in New York City. Well, different opinions, different perspectives. City-specific goals need, goals need city-specific solutions. Uh, and that's something we have to think about, and it can't always just be the way I think it's gotta go. We need to be able to sit at the table, work with folks and come up with um, collaborative decisions uh, and solutions. And what I've seen is the key to the programs that are going really well is that um, where you have both collaboration being prioritized and where you see maintenance driving some of the design and implementation of the program. So collaboration, uh, my definition of collaboration is a purposeful relationship in which all parties strategically choose to cooperate in order to achieve shared or overlapping objectives. When it comes to all kinds of site development projects, those parties that are involved uh, are many, right? We've got owners, municipalities, cities, we've got owners, reps, we've got architects, landscape architects. I always put the landscape architect ahead of the civil engineer out of respect, the civil engineer, geotechnical engineers. I added that late because I knew someone from RW Gillespie was on the call. Uh, all kinds of other trades as we go through uh, contractors, site contractors, landscape contractors, product distributors, crazy people like me, uh, and then you finally get into the actual ownership side. So property management, the users, the public, folks who are gonna be able to enjoy this site or gonna be frequenting this parking lot or this permeable surface or park right adjacent to this green infrastructure bump out. Um, a lot of folks to get together, and they're all interconnected in different ways, but we don't always collaborate as well as we could. Um, and you gotta step back and say, well, why, right? If we can get together, why aren't we getting together? Well, there's a lot of things that limit our collaboration. We see developers and even cities wanting to kind of save money on the soft cost side and bring permit level plans through to construction, which maybe lacks some of the detail. Uh, we see the engineer of record kind of cut out often after the project is permitted or, the, or once the project goes to bid, maybe come back to do a punch list at the end, which is usually pretty useless at that point. We see young engineers spending less time on site. We see, see civil engineers avoiding landscape architects. Um, and we see 
landscape architects avoiding civil engineers, not as much. I think it's more initiated by the civil engineer. Um, and, um, you know, we also don't allow contractors to speak into these programs to bring in just some common sense about how things might be able to be constructed or how we could actually be more effective and efficient with the costs of these projects. Um, and in a lot of cases, I'm not yet seeing the full understanding of maintenance costs folded in. And so we're already budgeting for that. Um, a lot of neighboring cities, some of the ones I've highlighted today are already further along in this process. So are we looking to those cities? Are we looking to see what we can learn as we start to implement our own, our own programs? And then finally, which we'll touch on in a little bit, the lessons learned in maintenance don't necessarily get back, brought back to design. And so we keep doing the same thing over and over again. And next minute, we've got hundreds of assets in the ground that we can't maintain and keep um, fresh and functional. So as it relates to design, you know, collaboration and design, there's a lot of things to this, but you know, we need as designers, we need to think about improving our specs. We need civil engineers and landscape architects to work together to fully understand that balance between the civil engineering design and the plant side of things, because these green infrastructure systems are very heavy on soils and plantings, and that needs that experience on the landscape architect side needs to be incorporated by the civil engineer. Uh, we need to think about better protecting systems during construction. So often we see these systems that are built perfectly, and then suddenly silts and sediments are driven into them before the project's complete. Not cool. Um, looking at pretreatment. Um, and uh, we want that green part of these systems to thrive. We want that to be a really high, highly aesthetic. When we think about specifications, you know, there's so many simple things we can do. You know, we want our systems to look like this and we end up after the fact frustrated because they maybe look like this, which is not something that we can really rave on to our customers or the public about. Um, and there's many things throughout the section from selection of mulch, from uh, the planting media or the soil that we're using and what that mix is and what kind of um, you know, quality control we're getting to get true um, water quality improvement out of. Um, Sub-base improvement, um, geotextiles, should we use them? Shouldn't we use them? Um, in some cases, we use multiple layers of geotextiles and then wonder why our systems are, are clogged um, many days after a storm event. Um, looking at the quality of the stone we're using, all these different things. And then what about the plantings? What about the plant health? You know, when we look at civil engineers and landscape architects, um, we can look at the civil engineering plan. It can be kind of boring, right? Um, where we have one type of plant out, laid out in perfect rows and lines, perfect, you know, on center to the nearest quarter of an inch. Or in a lot of so systems, we see extra riprap and no plantings at all, which, you know, again, a civil engineering masterpiece, uh, maybe not so much for the landscape architect side of things. But then we can also flip the coin and look at the landscape architect side of things and you know, if it's not clearly communicated to landscape architect what the goal is, we might have a system that has too many plants or maybe it's too closely spaced or too many species so that the maintenance crew maybe don't know what's a weed and what's a plant when it comes to maintaining it. So there's this balance between those two pieces that we need to get worked out. Um, trees, urban street trees, you know, we want our trees to look like this. We want them to replicate what they look like in the natural environment. But we do silly things. We put them in, you know, areas where there's not enough soil mass for that root system to thrive. You know, we just dig holes and put them in. And we look at even structural soils, but there's those structural soils are still uh, has a high stone content. It doesn't have those dedicated pathways for the roots. You know, there's lots of systems out there now. Uh, we work with one called the Arbor System by Green Blue Urban, where you can actually provide environments for these trees to go. Um, far beyond your, your typical expectations in the urban environment or the built environment where you have these plastic cells that hold uncompacted soil and you have this more infinite area for those tree roots to grow out and to get the kind of trees that we want to see in these areas. Um, so not just surviving, but actually thriving and actually growing up and, and lasting for an extended period of time. One of the biggest things I see in curb line green infrastructure is the challenge of um, protecting these surface systems. You know, we want these green infrastructure systems to look amazing, to want that high aesthetic value. Uh, we want them to filter pollutants, so get that water quality improvement. Uh, we want them to be maintenance free, which, you know, good luck to you on that one, but at least low maintenance. So have some kind of palatable um, maintenance um, plan and cost moving forward or frequency of maintenance. Um, but then we're also directing sediment and trash to them as well. Um, and that fourth item, it really compromises the upper three. Um, so what I've found is um, if we can incorporate pretreatment into our designs, 
then we can probably better achieve those top three goals. You know, we're not sending sediment and erosive velocity. So those are the two things, energy dissipation, collection of sediment debris. You know, now we're protecting the plants from being hammered by that erosive velocity. We're no longer clogging the surface of that filter. And we're making maintenance easier because now we may be cleaning out a little pre-treatment device as opposed to hand fossicking for sediment and debris all throughout our green infrastructure system. Um, you know, on a big site, we can do four bays. We can do all these things to hold and store some of that sediment. But in the urban curb line, I showed this photo earlier, it's much harder to do because you don't have the space. So a little product plug in here, you know, two of the things we're seeing highly used now in these curb line green infrastructure systems are um, one of these two systems. So we have a product called the Rain Guardian, another one called the little, the Pretex. Um, this Rain Guardian, not really getting to the features and functions, but the idea is it is a centralized location. You have a horizontal grade on top, vertical filter screen on the back. You can now centralize the storage of sediment um, there's actually now a rectangular version too, if the circular one is kind of weird for your geometry. Um, this is becoming a no-brainer for folks. We do hundreds of these each year ahead of our biofilters or even just regular bioretention. Um, and we've got a number of demos going with a number of cities right now. Uh, and there's a bunch of these scattered throughout um, Southern Maine if you're, if you're looking to see them in place. But what a smart idea, instead of just doing a pile of riprap, which is gonna be a lot of handwork and labor to clean and still deliver a lot of that set into your system, now maintenance easy as easy, pop the cover, clean it out and move on. And that's the kind of maintenance that's more palatable to a municipality because municipalities generally want to do like catch basins cleanings, not necessarily maintaining gardens. Um, so this really helps get it back to what they're comfortable with. Um, we have sidewalk crossing versions too. Here's a couple of examples from Scarborough Downs. There's a number of these systems uh, on the main roadway there as part of their tight green um, corridor through uh, that new project. Um, the pretext, just a deeper concrete box, same idea, putting some baffles and screens in place to protect that green infrastructure. A few years ago, we felt the audience would generally say, well, you know, hey, yeah, it's a little expensive. I think I'll just go some riprap. Now we have folks coming to us saying, hey, this isn't working. And we're seeing that on the city scale side of things, too. We even put simple things like domed overflow, little baskets uh, in these overflow devices to collect some of that mulch and floatables so that your downstream green infrastructure asset or your buried stone pit or tank system, whatever it might be, you know, you're protecting it from any of that floatable material too. So a lot of little bits and pieces you can tuck in to make these systems more um, palatable. So a couple of examples here is Scarborough Downs. Uh, this is some South Portland, Maine projects. This one was, um, um, th this one was designed by Goral Palmer. This one down here was uh, Sebega Technics many years ago. Uh, and then you have one here that Stantec designed for the city of Falmouth. Oh, sorry, the town of Falmouth. I think Justin's on the line. There are some adjustments being made to this to, to reduce that vertical drop to get those up a little bit. But you know what we're seeing is this key element of needing that pre-treatment to help protect the green infrastructure asset behind it. Beyond the design, and again, that's just a few of the things to kind of think about in construction. You know, there's a lot of pieces there that we can be collaborating on. So you know, getting um, contractors involved during the design phase. I mentioned that earlier, you know, have them speak into it, especially on these municipal, municipal programs, get a real sense of the true cost of certain types of details that you might be coming up with. Um, making sure there's construction oversight. So often that isn't part of the, the, the spec requirements. And then you got an engineer sitting at their desk, you know, biting their fingernails, wondering what's happening. You got the contractor in the field, maybe freestyling. Uh, those two pieces need to be connected, whether it's the engineer of record, third party inspections, uh, product representatives. We do a lot of that stuff just to kind of fill the gap. Pre-bid meetings. This is something that if I could, if there's one thing I could do in the world is require mandatory pre-bid meetings for all green infrastructure. Um, just so that all contractors are on the same page early on. So often we see um, bids that come in and you don't really know if they're qualified bids. You don't know if they fully understand. There's a little background noise there popping in there, but um, you don't know if uh, they fully understand the scope um, of the project. And then, you know, hopefully, and you hope that the low bidder understands it. Obviously, if you had that pre bid meeting, everyone's on the same page. They understand the soil mix, the expectations of the plants, how to protect them, how long that performance guarantee period might be. Uh, and then once you have a qualified bidder, obviously pre-construction meetings to make sure everyone's, you know, ready to go and, and link arms and work together as opposed to finger pointing throughout. I used to talk a lot about design collaboration. I used to talk a lot about um, construction collaboration, but if we, uh, we, know, we can fix all those things. We can design the most amazing specs and, and plans. We can coordinate with a contractor to the cows come home. But if we're not folding in maintenance, if maintenance isn't happening or if we don't have a budget for it, 
then what was all the point? What was the point of all that collaboration early on? Because we need these green infrastructure assets to work beyond six months, beyond the year one. We need them to be working for the long, long, long term. So a little word on collaboration and maintenance. Um, you know, we need to, uh, you know, it's always been a requirement or there's like a manual that says O&M, but it's often just sort of sitting there on a shelf getting, gaining dust. Um, these green cities or these green, green infrastructure assets, you know, we, we run the risk of having very weedy cities if we don't keep up with a maintenance plan that these systems might need. It's just like having a garden. Um, you know, we make the assumption that maintenance is going to happen, but will it? Uh, how can we improve the probability of it happening? Um, are we budgeting for it? Are we requiring inspection and reporting? But when we're doing these city scale practices, I mean, that's a big price tag when the more and more of these little EMPs you roll out, um, making sure that there's a, you know, a, an understood um, cost and there's a budget to, to manage that. Um, and what I found is systems either are really well maintained or really poorly maintained. Uh, there's very few that are kind of partly maintained. Um, and those lessons learned, whether it's frequency, whether it's cost, whether it's equipment, whether it's, you know, whatever, those need to come back to the beginning uh, to, the, to, to influence the future designs. They need, we need to be nimble and willing to make adjustments and updating our specs and guidelines based on what we learn. So we need to be study, studying these BMPs. And what I've found is that the cities that are focused on maintenance uh, and the cost of ownership are the ones that are really rising as leaders uh, in the space of uh, urban green infrastructure. So a couple of successes. I touched on Philly earlier. Um, you know, what I think makes Philadelphia's program successful uh, is there's a variety of green infrastructure options. So they're not limited to just one or two. Um, they allow for innovative solutions, um, which is um, uh, great. And that's where I've sort of helped out. Um, they understand that long-term cost of ownership uh, and they involve a whole bunch of partners in that collaborative process to make sure they get good outcomes. And they've invested in a lot of really talented people to get there. Um, but the thing I see is most successful is that maintenance is driving design. There is a maintenance has a seat at the table. Maintenance has a voice and maintenance speaks into design. And that's really cool to see at work. Um, and that's really where I got involved in Philadelphia Water Department's work. Um, and this is a little sampling of some of the things we've tinkered with. Uh, Philadelphia Water Department, otherwise known as PWD, um, they roll out what they call green inlet filters. So for all of their streetscape BMPs or their buried stone pits, or in our case, a lot of R tank type systems that are under the linear roadway um, sides and sidewalks, um, they have these green inlet filters, which is essentially high flow geotextile bags that are put in their grates um, to collect trash and debris to protect the downstream green infrastructure asset. But they had issues with these, um, with their product they were using. So they had issues with bag quality and bags breaking, tearing, bag to frame connection, frame durability. They had frames collapsing with the weight of the sediment because these cities produce a lot of trash and sediment. Um, and then some other unusual kind of factors, which was wanting to improve the safety during maintenance and obviously it being cost comparable. So we went through an R&D process back in 2018 for the whole year to basically come up with a better bag design, looking at not only the performance from a design standpoint, so looking at the particular fabric that was used and its flow rate and its ability to stop certain or trap certain particles, but also balancing the frequency of maintenance, the ease of maintenance, the weight of the unit when it was maintained. And it was really cool to see design and maintenance sort of, I'm um, not arguing with each other, but having a, you collaborating with each other and kind of, you know, uh, we this inner layer, this woven monofilament we use goes only halfway up the bag um, design one of the woven monofilaments to go the whole way up the bag um, to maximize the trapping of finer sediment. Maintenance said, ah, we want to come down a little bit and get into overflow mode a little sooner. So we have this polyethylene mesh with the larger openings inside and outside that goes above that filter fabric, balancing the weight uh, and the frequency of how, how quickly that would have to be maintained. So the product isn't really relevant to today's conversation. Um, but we, we designed a better mousetrap essentially, better frame so it wasn't going to collapse. A better bag to frame connection and a better bag. Um, but this is one of those things where we didn't have this product beforehand. We had to sit down with that specific city, look at their specific goals and tinker with it. Um, the design that they have, they put in what they call their city inlets, which is a, essentially a drain that looks like this. It's a two by four box set back from the curb line, manhole cover on top, very narrow opening or an inlet on the curb mouth. They were using these one by four rectangular bags um, to trap material as it came into the drain, which makes sense. You know, runoff comes in, get your sediment and debris, and there's a little bypass over the back. 
Um, the challenge was during maintenance. So during maintenance, folks would either lie down in the street with their legs out, you know, into the street, hand fossicking for sediment through that opening, um, or they'd pop the manhole cover and try to pull a one by four rectangle up through that circle. And as you can imagine, they were losing more than half of the um, accumulated sediment and trash into the drain while they were doing it. Now, if maintenance had no voice, they'd just keep going on. But fortunately, maintenance stopped and said, hold on, this is really unsafe for our team. And it's really counterproductive because we're dumping half the sediment we're trying to clean out into the drain when we do that maintenance. So this is a classic example of a detail and a product making sense, but not making sense once it was actually installed. So we had to come up with a unit that was gonna be easy to um, install, minimize loss of sediment, uh, and certainly get your legs out of the street. So we went through around eight rounds of prototyping and R&D. We did a whole bunch, this is some markups from Philadelphia Water Department. The first unit we made, we thought, oh, this is awesome. We're gonna use a circular bag. It'll line up with a manhole, which is what we finished with, but you know, so you don't lose any sediment, you can clean it in place, bring it out of the bag without tipping it. This is awesome. Um, but the face of our unit was eight inches high and this opening was only an inch and a half high. So we ended up coming up with a unit finally after testing out materials and different fabrics and, and weights and thicknesses and all types of things. We came up with a unit um, that could actually fold all the way down into an inch and a half height like a little transformer and then be inserted and opened up uh, and installed uh, in the drain. So over, once it was installed, no more legs in the street, no more loss of sediment during maintenance. Um, and as a result, uh, we are now, um, and that, that's, that's kind of, I don't know the slide. Um, we're now, we now sort of built out this full family of products for them, which is their, their spec and their requirement for all of their green inlet filters uh, in their roadway projects. From there, we got a call from New York City um, and they have these uh, right away infiltration basins. And they said, hey, look, we see what you're doing in Philadelphia. What can you do with us for us in New York? They had the issue of these little inlet boxes clogging these stone systems within weeks. We have these little eight inch perforated pipes feeding into the stone system and city nastiness happening and completely compromising them from day one. So the, we thought, oh, great, we can use the filter bags. This will be awesome. Well, no, different city, different goals. They're all trying to trap trash and debris just for pretreatment, but in the case of New York City, we ended up with a metal screen basket with um, half inch um, circular openings actually in the metal screen. So a very different approach to how to trap fines versus more coarse material, um, but um, interesting nonetheless. So this is part of the standard right away details now too. And I don't show this like, oh, you should use this device in, in your project. That's not the point. The point is that it took the voice of maintenance of working with design and then in a collaborative way coming up with a solution uh, to help protect these green infrastructure assets and something we all need to be thinking about. Now, what's really interesting is there's one common element in these cities regarding the maintenance. And that is everything that we've created so far for cities has been focused on pretreatment, which I think shouldn't be glazed over. Um, we're seeing that, yes, we're rolling out these BMPs. Every city has their own little individual kind of take on it. Um, but the big issue folks are having post-installation is how to better protect and pretreat. And when you do that, now maintenance becomes more palatable, less frequent and lower cost. And that makes the overall cost of these programs uh, much, much more manageable. I'll go back to my slide earlier, you know, no two cities are the same, different design variables, what space is available, what style grate exists, what are typical watershed sizes? Do you have sleep, steep slopes or not? Uh, what's the pollutant of concern? And again, in all these cities, it's just trash and debris. That's different to what we're dealing with, you know, up in Maine a lot of the time. We need to manage phosphorus. So we need higher end, more honestly costlier um, uh, treatment, uh, treatment systems because we need to get a higher level of water quality treatment. Um, and we don't often have favorable soils to infiltrate. So it's a slightly different kind of approach. Um, so honestly, the cost of doing business per acre in a city like the Portland, Portland Maine is probably gonna be higher um, than you might see in some of these other cities that are just purely providing subsurface storage or volume. Um, then you've got these other variables like we talked about, opinions, perspectives, past experiences, budgets, equipment, expectations um, for aesthetics and whatnot. And uh, every city has a different, different approach. So again, having to work collaboratively to come up with um, city-specific solutions um, to, to satisfy city-specific goals. 
uh, and then the final thing, just tucking in there, is winter considerations, right? When you're doing permeable surfaces, we have to think about the winter. When we think about salt on concrete, we have to think about the winter. When we think about where the snow is being piled, and it generally ends up in the green infrastructure system because it's kind of a convenient recessed area. That's a good place for some snow. Let's throw it in there. We've got higher levels of sand. So again, after the winter, some of these green infrastructure systems, if they don't have pretreatment, are covered in sand. They look more like a beach or a sand filter than they do you know, a green infrastructure BMP. So these are all things that add additional challenges to us right up in our um, beautiful, you know, home city of Portland. And what we see is when collaboration is done poorly, we get frustrated owners. We get frustrated contractors. We get frustrated engineers. We get frustrated landscape architects. No one on this call who's a landscape architect would want us to come out and uh, use any of these projects as a case study for their experience with green infrastructure. And then we get frustrated public. And we get when we get frustrated public, that can really stunt the growth of green infrastructure in that region. You know, a couple of bad projects, some vocal, um, you know, neighborhood associations saying, "Ooh, we thought we were getting this. This is what we got. We don't like this," and that can really um, push back the, um, the sort of furtherance of, of green infrastructure, which is such a great um, option to again restore some of that natural uh, stormwater management process that we've lost over the years as we as we've continued to build out and create more and more uh, impervious area. Um, and interestingly, a lot of folks think, well, oh, collaboration, oh, that's gonna cost too much money. Like that's more meetings and everyone's hourly rate, add those all together, is it really worth it? That's a lot of extra money. But we spend a little money on the front end to get those things resolved. We have less redesign um, uh, when it comes to you know, going to construction. We have, um, well, in the case of not collaborating, we end up getting more change orders and those change orders are like, you know, cha-ching moments for a lot of contractors. So the better we can get that stuff resolved beforehand, the lower those add-ons are going to be during construction. Now more RFIs, all that administrative stuff that comes with it, um, higher long-term maintenance uh, and potential BMP reconstruction, right? If they're not built right, they're probably going to linger and be issues for us moving forward. Um, and then obviously on the public side, you know, the additional complaints and things that have to be managed. So I would challenge us to think about spending a little more money on the front end, I think is going to end up being a lower cost than the cost associated with um, fixing things, you know, during and after a project. So final thoughts as we kind of get to the end. Um, uh, well, you know, I believe that collaboration is critical to successful projects. And let me also say, you know, I highlighted some of these projects. I don't know everything about these projects, you know, and these programs that are out there around the country. This is just my little Rob Woodman perspective on some of these things. Um, so there's a lot more to know about all of those, all of those programs. Um, but what I've seen is maintenance has to be part of that conversation. And I'm encouraged to see that. I'm encouraged in Maine that there's that requirement now with any of these new permit projects that you have to have not just a draft contract, but a signed contract in place for maintenance after construction. Um, that's a good step. Obviously, we've got to work about how to, you know, how to enforce that. Um, but on the city scale side of things, making sure when we look at our sort of bang for the buck when it comes to what's a good location to put in a GSI feature, um, folding in the complexities or the costs of maintenance in that specific you know, corner or street um, that you might be working on. Um, like I've mentioned a few times, pre-treatment is this common theme that keeps popping up. So I think for the work we're doing locally, keeping that in mind, whether using the devices I threw on the board or not, but making sure that we're thinking not about just how it looks on a plan or how it looks day one, but how is it gonna perform when rain actually hits it and when city nastiness actually hits it. Um, and again, like I've said probably seven times during this presentation, you know, every city and municipality is unique. So our approach to solutions and maintenance will also be unique. And we have to consider that as designers and being flexible. So it's not just like, oh, this works really well for how I can get you a permit, but let's think about maintenance and costs. And is that a realistic thing for your particular client to be able to take on post-construction? And then finally, you know, collaboration doesn't happen by accident. Um, it's something you must choose to do. So a lot of times we sit back and think, man, it'd be really good if someone would kind of initiate it. I would encourage you on the line today, maybe to be that initiator of collaboration uh, in your sphere of influence. As we think about you know, creating purposeful relationships in which all parties strategically choose to cooperate in order to achieve shared or overlapping objectives, I believe that is a key truth that we need to think about when it comes to bringing you know, into the engineering design community, the landscape architects, the clients, the maintenance side, and then the public and all the other parties that fit in between there um, to getting uh, good outcomes as we try to deploy uh, green infrastructure um, throughout, you know, Southern Maine uh, and beyond. 
so that's kind of all I have. I think timing wise, we're not in bad shape. Um, and I think there's time for questions and, and other things uh, like that. Thank you, Rob. That was amazing. So thank you very much. Um, if everyone around can put your cameras back on so we can actually see you. Um, I'm really thrilled that we have this and that it's also being recorded. So um, I have been promising probably for two months now that PSA is gonna have YouTube channels, but um, it is in the works. So this will be available on our own YouTube, um, but I'll also email this out to, um, to everyone as well as we are shifting over our electronic communication. Um, so with that, I would love to open this up for discussion and, and questions. I'm sure many of you have some comments. Um, yes, Mark. Rob, good afternoon. Let me just start out by saying I've heard you do a lot of presentations and this one took the cake. Well done. <laughs> uh, well done, really. And um, I think, I think, you know, the largest reason I say that is because of, of your uh, focus on, on the maintenance aspect. Um, I was at ASLA National uh, when it was in Philadelphia, actually, and there was a lot of the presentations that actually uh, were really focusing on that. And in private, in private industry, um, all too often, um, facilities and maintenance folks aren't at the table. And then they get saddled at the end of the project with all these BMPs uh, that are regulatory driven and uh, you know the project has to do, and they haven't a clue how to maintain them. So you know what does DEP do? They they require, as you mentioned earlier, uh, maintenance contracts, uh, things of that nature, which is which is good, but it doesn't beat boots on the ground. So you know I th I think one of the things that uh, has to happen is increased education and outreach amongst all the constituent players, uh, you know, that you've identified from the consulting, from the regulatory, uh, from the contracting standpoint, it's a long process, you know, uh, but um, they, you know, people, people need to be made more aware that A, this is the future, it, you know, it, it, old gray infrastructure isn't the way we're gonna do things and old style detention ponds fenced in in the back of the property aren't the answer. Um, and, and they all, um, you know, the system is getting more complex whether they like it or not, and they, they need to get on board. So, so thank you for that. Um, it's a lot of conversations that I have had sort of ongoing, like with Karem Gungor up there in, in Augusta and his predecessors and whatnot. And, and, uh, folks at the city level, just just kind of talking about all these aspects. So, well done. Um, I'll have to pick your brain some more sometime. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I think you're right. I think so often the you know the focus is so much on the building component and the site work is like a means to an end for a lot of developers. Um, so it's hard to get folks to care about some of the stormwater stuff. But I know when I look about back on my consulting days, a lot of times. Uh, I, with my colleagues, were picking BMPs that just sort of made sense based on the way the, the ground was, you know, the way things were graded, where I could outlet things to. And it was really much the engineer making the decision on behalf of that developer, which needs to be part of the process. But when you look at all these BMPs, I mean, take um, concrete permeable pavers, for example. I do a, a lot of work with those. You know, those don't do well with a ton of salt on them. And so, you know, while there might be an area that says, hey, this is great for concrete permeable pavers from a permitting standpoint, you know, we can do all the subsurface sand filter stuff directly in that place. Um, you know, you've got to have a conversation with the owner about, hey, these are the implications. You've got to change the way you maintain your parking lot um, so that you don't compromise the surface. Um, and even though that might be the easy way from a permitting standpoint, if it's not the right fit for that owner, um, then it, you may have to do something different, you know, and I think, you um, the challenge is, you know, you can educate people all day long. Um, the challenge is whether the, the person who's listening is, it, it cares enough. But um, I think you're right on point, Mark. And uh, uh, hopefully, you know, what DEP's put together is sort of the foundation to 
get to that next level of not just making a requirement, not make, just making sure it happens, but actually impacts the way we as the designers maybe kind of approach our um, permitting work. Okay. Amy, Garen, you had a question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Rob, I'm wondering if you have experience working with downtown improvement districts to help, uh, you know, just further the messaging, convene, bring people together on these ideas. And if there are anyone um, that, that comes to mind, you can maybe connect us with if, just to kind of continue to share ideas and, and uh, work together in the right way. Yeah, um, great question. Um, and I can certainly connect with you, Amy, on that with a variety of different groups that I've worked with. A lot of the groups I think are generally on the smaller, more neighborhood style, you know, type of um, approach where we've come in and, you know, helped with a variety of retrofits and then supported the public education side of things as part of that. Um, we've done a lot of design of placards and all kinds of things to kind of help there. Um, but um, yeah, we can connect uh, and I'd certainly be happy to share some of my experiences that aren't as local. Um, there's a number of, you know, smaller neighborhoods in the Pittsburgh area um, and uh, a couple of towns in, in the, in the uh, suburbs of Boston as well that might be good references. Thank you. As a follow-up, I'm sure, similar to, uh, to Amy. Yeah, and I think um, and just to add to that a little bit there, you know, the, the, love, the thing I love about Southern Maine and being based here is that even though I'm supporting things in a, mar a larger geography, um, I'm most intimately involved um, right here. So we've done a lot of support of like 319 grant funded projects where, you know, on paper, we're just providing product, but I can't help myself but to dive in a little further and really um, have, a, have a vested interest in, in the education side of things. Um, and actually one of the things that Ferguson, they're a better funded company that now owns ACF. Uh, we're actually launching a national green infrastructure grant program internally. So, and I've forced them to just do New England only to start with so that we can really look at some of the projects that many of you might be involved in and, and consider supporting on a demonstration side of things, you know, what you could do uh, in areas that you have some influence. Brilliant. Teresa, you were muted. So if you wanted to ask your question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Hi, Rob. Um, I'm the lead of a neighborhood association that is not a downtown district, but we're Main Street in Portland. Yep. And part of the question I have is maintenance is the issue. We watched a lot of construction happening here and maintenance is just never part of the plan. And I'm more thinking around the funding level and the organization of building that in. Do you know any areas that are doing that to build in for dollars to follow maintenance? Because we've got what we have here is a bunch of volunteers who go out and do the maintenance that's not getting done by the city. It was never planned or by MDOT because it was not planned and parks and rec can't keep up with every little tree well. Um, it's, it's, it, so where are there any projects that you're aware of that fund some organization to manage the, the lower level, you know, gardener level care about my neighborhood? Yeah, it's one of the blessings and the curses of green infrastructure. It's generally aesthetically pleasing. So neighborhoods can easily take pride in it and kind of it's a very practical thing to contribute to. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, look, I've seen it on the city scale. Um, Philly, pretty proactive. Some of these other cities definitely in a reactive way and are now scrambling to work out. You know, I know in New York a few years ago at the point where they had about 5,000 right away bioswales, they had a maintenance crew that was only capable of maintaining 400 of them in a year. So like, you know, and they didn't, they need to be maintained more than once, you know, a year. So it just continues to perpetuate in a negative sense. You continue to get further and further behind. Um, and it, it, down there, it, the fear was we have to hire more people. And I also, I pushed back saying, well, you know, if you actually put in pre-treatment devices, you might be able to defer the maintenance on those things. But yeah, I mean, it's tough. I think a lot of cities, you know, even if they have budgeting in place, it's another level to actually have the team to go do it, you know, and cities, I mean, city of Portland, you know, they have expectations to clean catch basins X number of times per year. I don't think it's feasible to even do that alone. So then you add, you know, green infrastructure assets, regardless of whether the money's there, it's been budgeted for, there's a, there's a human capital part there that I think is probably the more important piece beyond um, budgeting. Mm -hmm. Teresa, I wonder too, if you could even inquire within the Main Street program if they have, I mean, it's a national program. So are there, are there other cities that might have pilots where they're looking? Yeah, I would, I would absolutely do that. And also the, who are the, you know, the visionaries that are local that would be willing to even be part of the funding of 
like small groups, neighborhood, there's several neighborhood associations that are all already 501c3 nonprofits organized, but in order to either oversee or to have their volunteers have the, you know, the capacity to do the low level maintenance requires some buy-in on the vision that it's not, you know, suggestions around become a BID or, be, or get a tip. It's like, that, those are too big for what we're looking for. So yeah, Main Street plus, plus who are the local visionaries, I guess. Any other questions? No, there's that, that moment, that quiet pause. Um, Rob, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and again, it is always lovely to see everyone. Um, some of you are becoming regulars, which is awesome. Um, and some are new to this. Um, like I said, um, at the start of this, our mechanics of the built environment on the design review process for the city of Portland will be um, I said it was the week of the 25th. It's actually February 24th at one o'clock in the afternoon, but everyone will get an e-blast with an announcement. Um, and then in March, um, we're actually taking the month, um, whether this is oddly morbid or not, um, but just to look at one, one year since being hit by COVID and our new distancing. So we have a very robust plan of programming um, about innovation, spatial uh, practice and change um, and what that means at a variety of scales and levels. So that too is, will be shared with all of you. Um, Rob, once again, this was awesome. Um, for all of you, you have his email address that was in the announcement that I sent this morning. If you have any questions, you can direct them to Rob. If you have any ideas or topics that we should include in our series, also please let me know. You have my email. Um, and we are really producing programs weekly with the exception of vacation weeks when I will have a four-year-old crawling all over me. Um, <laughs> so, and I'm sure you will too, if you have children. Um, once again, thank you so much and enjoy your day. Thanks, Addie. Thanks everyone.